Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. We are back here in studio today for April 1st. I think Mother's Nature uh, won the April Fool's joke of the year this year with the uh, snow on the ground this morning. But uh, we're back here. A nice little break. How you doing, Val? Well, it's been a sad week, unfortunately, Steve, after the passing of Dick Belcher. Um, he was really an early supporter of mine. I mean, if you called him just a bank president, that would really be kind of limiting him in terms of his impact on this community, and he was certainly one of my big backers when I was a young sports writer and wanting to know who was who in this town, and he was, you know, always always backing me, and he had me on his radio show way back in the day, so that's kind of how I learned how to talk into a microphone. So thank you, Dick, for all you did for me. Thank you for all you did for the community, and our condolences go out to his family and friends. Yeah, a great uh, pillar for this community for sure, and uh, I don't know if you've seen the video that I put together yet, but it's on our Facebook page, it's on Twitter as well, or RTC4, and uh, one of the uh, first shows that I was able to pop up, we used to film the uh, first federal show every Friday, and one of the first shows that popped up was uh, was a young Val Saturis on, on there, so... Uh, that's in there. Uh, Joe McCarter was in there and won. And a lot of uh, area, uh, you know, the who's who of the area. And, uh, yeah, he was for sure a, uh, a pillar and a pinnacle, you know, the pinnacle award winner from Purdue. That was part of uh, what was in there yeah. as well. And just a, a super nice guy. You obviously, uh, you know, go farther back with him than I do. But, uh, you know, he was on the board here at RTC. Um, you know, on the board at Woodlawn, on a lot of uh, different boards, and you know, gotta give him a lot of credit. Started a bank out of uh, the back room of a grocery store in 1966, and and look what he uh, was able to build. Mm -hmm. And uh, more than just a business person, like you said. Yeah. So uh, yeah, he's he's gonna be missed. Uh, unfortunately, you know, uh, ALS. It's 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 bad. You know. Uh, mm -hmm watching the deterioration over the last few years has been tough and it's not a it's not a fun thing to have and so uh, we do uh you know condolences to the family and and all of the uh the family at first federal as well mm -hmm. so today's show uh we're going to be uh going into our winter sports teams uh all rtc teams we're going to go down through uh boys and girls swimming the wrestling and then the boys and girls basketball teams and you know it's it's getting into the the spring sports season some things are starting to happen uh, spring sports wise uh, but we're gonna kind of hold off on talking spring sports we'll get more into that next week as we're gonna actually start our broadcasting for some spring uh, events coming up next week we'll have uh, actually we're gonna start off down at Caston next Thursday we'll be uh, down there for uh, a baseball game and then be back at Caston uh, just the way it worked out on Friday for a softball game. So a couple of Caston events and then next Saturday we'll be at Fansler for a uh, little round robin with uh, Rochester, Carroll, and Pioneer. So that should be an interesting early season softball matchup for sure. Mm -hmm. So... And then the, the baseball team will be at uh, Bob Copeland Field that Saturday as well on a uh, with a doubleheader uh, against John Glenn. Right, and we just found that Rochester's not playing baseball at LaVille tomorrow, Saturday, and said that game was pushed back to Thursday. Yeah. Yeah, you know, that's the way the spring season goes. We kind of get some, some weather changes and delays, and uh, so we'll... Uh, you know, we're going to try and split our time the best we can throughout our uh, our coverage area as far as spring sports goes and, and get you a little bit of coverage from everybody. But we're going to obviously do a lot of focus on our uh, Rochester Zebras uh, baseball and softball teams for sure. Mm -hmm. So uh, you ready to jump into the all RTC teams? Well, there's a reason why my hair is gray, so let's just get it over with. <laughs> let's get it over with. So we're going to start out yeah, with... This, uh, this was... Yeah, um, some of them were pretty pretty kind of clear cut in terms of who was first team and who was second team, but it's it's never easy to pick these teams. There's always a couple that you say, "Boy, oh boy," right? That are, that are tough. Well, it is, it is, and that's a, it's a good problem to have that we have so many good uh, competitors in our area that uh, you know we've got to really filter through. And um, you know, I, I think when we get down to it, we'll we'll talk more about it. But I, I know uh, we talked quite a bit about our boys' mm -hmm. basketball winner. 
there was, you know, a lot of different uh, avenues we could have went. And in the end, it's it's our I team, mean, like you said on the on the blog. Right, it's our team. We did, I mean, coaches. I mean, yeah, we we asked them for advice. We asked them to give us kind of their insights on their team. But we picked the team. Right. So if 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 you don't like who we if you don't like the team, take it up with us. Don't leave the coaches alone. Yeah. But so, the, the boys' basketball, our player of the year pick, I think I went back and forth at least about five times. Right, right. And with about three or four different kids. Right. All right, well, without further ado, let's jump right into it. Let's start off with girls swimming. The girls swimmer of the year is Elena Bodie. Yeah, it's Elena Bodie. She's the pick. She was... Uh, probably the most versatile swimmer in our area. She could do anything from the IM to the breaststroke to the sprint freestyles. She was the only area swimmer who made it into two different sectional finals. And she was by far the highest point scorer on Rochester's team. She had a great senior year. She really, and it was really great to watch her improve from year to year to year. And for her to get to this point, uh, she just did a great job. Yep. And well, that was the TRC champ, I think, in the 100 breaststroke. Yeah. And then let's take a look then at the rest of the uh, all RTC swimmers from the girls' side. All right. Kendall Craig from Valley, only a sophomore, was the best distance freestyle in her area. She uh, did the 200 free and the 500 free and was very good in both events. Chloe Chan from Pioneer, she was second in the sectional in the 100 butterfly, excuse me, 100 breaststroke, 111. Great time, only a sophomore. So. Uh, just a terrific young swimmer. Uh, has kind of a nice little rivalry with that Columbia City swimmer. Weird to think of Columbia City versus Pioneer rivalry. Not exactly <laughs> geographically close, but yeah, the girl from Columbia City who beat her in the breaststroke in the sexual is also a sophomore, so two more years of that rivalry. And then Maddie Broya from Rochester. We picked a diver. Uh, Maddie just had a great, great year. Picked up diving for the first time and made it to diving regional. Yeah. Finished third. Of course, an accomplished gymnast already, so kind of use some of those, uh, you know, gymnastics skills that she learned and kind of brought it to the diving board. Right. Then honorable mention, McKenna Smith. We'll be talking about uh, a sibling of McKenna later on in this show, but McKenna was herself an outstanding swimmer. Uh, you know, she swam, she swam a lot at the club level. Very good in the breaststroke. Also made the finals in that. Uh, you know, but also an, another girl who's just a very good overall swimmer. Kendall Bradley, uh, probably the best sprint fr uh, freestyler in our area. And not only that, she picked up diving this year. Mm. So she did that combination. I, again, I, I think it's I'm, – I'm just so impressed that she could do that, especially diving. You're kind of performing and everybody's kind of staring at you. And if you're – for her to do that, I mean, she's just uh, really just a, a poised, gifted athlete, poised swimmer. I, uh, I, I felt like we needed to have her on the team. Emily Chan, Chloe's older sister, she's a senior, uh, another very good swimmer on that Pioneer team who an, an, you know, could do a lot of different events. And then uh, Bella Riffle of Rochester, um, you know, a, a solid mainstay. You could count on her scoring in multiple events most every meet. Yeah. So that's a, that's a pretty good list. You know, not all of our teams swim. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking at it, you're like, well, why are there no swimmers from, you know, Argus or Culver, obviously, because they don't have a pool, so they don't swim. But uh, that's a it's a very good list. Um, I believe did Emily and Chloe um, share the HNAC Swimmer of the Year? Um, I'm trying to think. I was just over there for the uh, Winter Sports Award, and it seemed like they were uh, part of that uh, HNAC uh, conference. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, some some very accomplished uh, swimmers. And divers in that list. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of good Chans. Uh, Chan at Pioneer and a lot of Craigs have swam at Valley over the right. years. Right. And a lot of Bodies have swam at Rochester over the years right. now. Yeah. Right. A lot of family names mm -hmm. there that you're very familiar with. Mm -hmm. So that is your all RTC girls uh, swimming first team and honorable mention team. Mm -hmm. And course we'll have the stories the full stories up on the blog here after uh, we get done here we just didn't want to post those obviously and, and spoil all the suspense right mm -hmm. so that's the that's the girls team so uh, now if you want to take a look at the all area boys team and the all area RTC boys swimmer of the year and you talked about it the uh, you know Smith 
and the uh, the winner is the uh, freshman. It's Marcus a freshman, Smith. Mark. It's a freshman, Marcus Smith from Valley, and uh, you know, basically, he did in an hour what a lot of young high school swimmers would never do in a lifetime. I mean, he made it to the state finals and three different events. He did it in the 200 medley relay, he did it in the 200 individual medley, and he did it in the 100 butterfly. I mean, butterfly was his best stroke, but as, he, as we saw in the IM, he's pretty good in all the strokes. I mean, he won that IM by about six seconds over the rest of the field at the sectional. That's, yeah. At the conference, he won that race, I think, by like 15 seconds. Yeah. I mean, you just don't see a kid. I mean, he went 203 at the, in the conference, and then I was like, whoa. I mean, in... 17 years of covering the sport. I don't. 18 years of covering the sport. I don't think I've seen a a kid go 203 in the IM. A boy go 203 in the IM. Mm -hmm. And then he went two minutes flat in the sectional. He got even faster mm. as the season went on. And he's 14 years old. And you know this is a kid who you know you swam a lot at the club level. Um, his dad is his most recent coach, Scott. But he's had a lot of different coaches who helped him out and. You know, Katie Bradley has done a great job of kind of keeping those kids motivated. And, you know, it was a small Valley team. I think they have only like five, five kids, six kids. But mm -hmm. he was one of them, and he had an awesome year. Yeah, and, and for as small of a team as they had, they made some noise in the sectional. I mean, they, they really were uh, were able to do some uh, do some things. Yeah, I mean, fifth, fifth place in the sectional. But, when again, when you only have five or, five or six kids, that's yeah. really quite quite impressive. Right. So let's take a look here at who uh, joins Mr. Smith on the all-area team. Well, the best distance freestyle in our area was Jake Seifer from Rochester. Uh, 150, he got his 200 free down, time down to 150, and he got his 500 free time down to 505. And can he get under five minutes in the future? I, I wouldn't bet against him. Another young uh, swimmer as yeah, well. Yeah, he's only a sophomore, and mm -hmm. he's, um, you know, he's really uh, – uh, you know, you can tell he's he's improved his body, and he, you know, in terms of endurance, that's never been a problem. Again, Jake, I mean, he did all different kinds of events during the year, but it was finally, uh, but it was kind of those those distance freestyle events where he kind of found a home mm -hmm. toward the end of the year. And he had a great year. I think he was third in both the 200 free and the 500 free at sectional. Uh, just a great year overall for Jake. Yeah. And then uh, as you look down the honorable mention list. Yeah. Car uh, Carson Parker from Valley, great in the breaststroke. Uh, all, he's only a sophomore, mm -hmm. so this is another. He's a kid who's just, he's kind of got that ideal build for a swimmer. He's got that kind of tall, long arms, long legs. He just kind of cuts through the pool easily. And then Caden Kelly from Rochester to make diving regionals four years in a row, just an outstanding accomplishment. And he broke the school record for the uh, 11 dive, um, you know, root, you know uh, 11 dive meet. Um, you know, there's six dives for the weekday meets, 11 dives for the conference and sectionals. He, he broke the 11 dive record in the sectional. Just a great, great year overall for Cade. Just a great, great career overall. Mm -hmm. uh, and then honorable mention, I, we picked five. Uh, I, I couldn't, I felt like I, I, I need, we needed to name all these kids. Brandon Hoffman, what a career. 100 freestyle, 100 backstroke were his, were his best events. Um, you know, he got down to, I think, right around 50 seconds in the 100 freestyle. That is flying. 56 in the 56 seconds in the 100 uh, backstroke, a great swimmer. Isaac Whetstone from Valley, another one of those freshmen from Valley who's so talented. Um, swam that anchor leg in the 200 medley relay where it was all on him to bring it home, and he did. And he's also a great distance freestyler. He's, I mean, he is, he's only one or two strokes right behind Jake Seifer, mm -hmm. you know, if you put him in the pool together. Uh, Dylan Steininger from Rochester made it to two individual finals of the sectional. Great career for Dylan, another kid who just gradually improved. I think we talked about Dylan the same way during cross-country season. He's a kid who just gradually improved in all his events over the course of his career. Uh, Ryan Logan from Pioneer, unfortunately, uh, had a DQ in the sectional. But, you know, he he, he was definitely, I mean, as a, you know, again, a lot of good young swimmers at Pioneer. Ryan's a senior, though, and he was kind of that leader of the team, mm -hmm. and he had a great year. And then Bradley Bickle from Rochester, he broke the six-dive record at Rochester. So, yeah, I mean, I felt like we needed to, to somehow recognize both Caden and Bradley. Mm -hmm. uh, two senior divers, both had great, great years. And Bradley made it to Diving Regional for the first time this year, so kudos to him. Yeah, it's a great accomplishment. Um, you know, it's a, an accomplished list there uh, as well. Mm -hmm. 
But yeah, we should mention that I think we we maybe talked about this earlier. Pioneers got a lot of young swimmers. Mm-hmm. They just didn't quite make this list, but we we thought about them a lot. Kids like Kitchell and Brooke and Woodhouse, mm-hmm. uh, a lot of good young freshman swimmers at Pioneer, and they, they might make this list in the future. Yeah, yeah, and it's uh, you know a group that I think they won the the Hoosier North Conference mm-hmm. uh, as a group and. Of course, you know, there's not, like we said, there's not a lot of teams in that conference that swim. Uh, TRC has more mm-hmm. uh, percentage-wise uh, teams that swim in their conference. Right. But, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a nice young group of uh, kids over there. Right. Instead of, right, they, they, and maybe not one star on the team, but a lot of just good depth on that team. Yeah. So that is the boys swimming uh, all-RTC team and the uh, honorable mention team as well. Uh, the next one, um, wrestling-wise, I, I don't think you probably had uh, a whole lot of sleepless nights as far as <laughs> picking the top wrestler of the year. I would have had some sleepless nights if I didn't pick this kid because he would. <laughs> not a, not a big shock yeah. here. The uh, RTC wrestler of the year is the heavyweight state champion Marshall Fishback. Yeah, I mean, an amazing. Uh, his story is the most about amazing story of any high school athlete I've ever met. I mean, from where he was to where he got, and um, you know, it was it was interesting to watch his life and career play out. I mean, we saw him win semi state at Fort Wayne, and we thought it can't get better than this, can it? <laughs> and it did, right? And uh, I mean, because remember, Rochester never had a semi state champion, or at least hadn't had a semi state champion in decades, mm-hmm. and that's since they had moved to the Fort Wayne semi state, and yet he just, I mean. You know, that he got to a point where he was a really, really good wrestler last year, and then all that he did to get to a state, to become a state champion, it's really, a, you know, kind of a, a great lesson in never being satisfied. I mean, he he talked about all the all that he ate, like four eggs for breakfast, and he goes, that, that, he goes that's not fun eating. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, putting like a peanut butter on toast, like eating four pieces of that. I mean, he goes, it's not, it's not always fun, mm-hmm. um, but... But he he put on that twenty pounds, and when you combine that, but he didn't lose any of his agility mm-hmm. at the same time, even though he put on that weight, and it really got to the point of I mean to think you go to the state finals and you don't allow a takedown the entire state finals. I mean wrestling against the best kids in the state, um, it, 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 his his transformation as a person and as an athlete is unlike any I've seen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and you know what a wonderful story, and and you know just per- perseverance, and uh, you know it, it's just a great accomplishment. You can see the the community, mm-hmm. uh, you know, coming coming around and coming together with him is, is you know, right, special. right. I mean, he talked to, right, and he he's talked a lot, and the Clint Guards talked a lot about the inf- the influence of the Swango family on his life, mm-hmm. being great friends, kind of helping mentor him along. The role that kind of Noah Swango, who graduated last year, kind of his role and how close he is with Aaron and Eli and how they brought him in and kind of creating that wrestling kind of culture and mindset and this, to him that kind of helped bring him along. I don't know if it takes a village to bring to raise a state champion, but it maybe helps a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Kind of seems like there was a lot of people that had an influencing uh, hand in that. Mm-hmm. Yep, sure was. But, yeah, I mean, I, again, he to watch Marshall wrestle – I mean, kind of how he would size up the opponents to sometimes not only watch Marshall and his body language, but watch the body language of his opponents. Mm-hmm. Like, oh boy, how am I gonna, what am I going to do with this guy? Yeah. Uh, some kids, they get intimidated, and that's just Marshall being Marshall. Well, let's take a look at who you had uh, in the uh, mix with Marshall. All right, we picked one kid in each weight class for first team, then one kid in each weight class for honorable mention. At 106, we went with Eli Wildermuth of Winnemac, uh, conference champion. 113, Wyatt Davis of Rochester, a state qualifier as a freshman, the first Rochester kid to make state as a freshman since Garrett James, I think back in 2004. Mm-hmm. I mean, Wyatt was, he was just one of those guys where you'd see him and you, you were like, you got to see this kid wrestle. I mean, he is just, he is just a dynamo of energy out there and mm-hmm. just a, and great technique, too. Um, unfortunately lost in his uh, Friday match at State, but bigger and be- even bigger and better things ahead for Wyatt Davis. I mean, right. he was, I mean, this is a kid, I mean, you know, like the, he, he pinned a kid from Collin twice 
in less than a minute. Like he spent like 58 seconds total on the mat with that kid, and that kid was a state qualifier. Hmm. I mean, that kid from Cowan was not a not a chump. Right. I mean, he was a really good wrestler, and why beat him twice? 120. Ethan Holloway, you're heartbroken for him and that he didn't make state. He only lost one match all year, but unfortunately that was a semi-state ticket match. But Ethan was just, he raised his level. I mean, he was already a really, really good wrestler as a freshman, sophomore, and as a junior. He raised it to a totally different level. He won conference. He won sectional. He won regional. He is a guy who just, you know, lives it. I mean, he, you know, I mean, he, in terms of the lifestyle, Coach Gar talks about his weight management as, you know, I want all my kids to manage their weight the way he does. Mm-hmm. And and he is just, um, he's got seemingly all the moves. And on top of that, he's a really good athlete. I mean, a really good, he, he can be the aggressor, he can be the counterattacker mm-hmm. as well. 126, Aaron Swango, he's another kid who I, I didn't expect to win conference sectional and regional. I did not expect that. Mm-hmm. I, I thought he'd be better. But I didn't know he was this good. And, I mean, just the confidence that he came out with. I mean, you, know, you saw signs of it in his first couple of years, but now just the, it was all about just the confidence that, that he had. And and even even I, I still think in that regional match when he was he was down and he came back and he pinned the guy from Western. I mean, just a, a sign that he is just uh, – and you can see how much the kids like him and revere him. 132, Drake Montalongo from Valley. I mean, Drake was just so consistent over the course of his career. He made it to semi-state three times in his career. Unfortunately, he ran into a kid from Manchester, Dylan Stroud, at the conference who denied him a conference champion, but Drake was among the – I mean, he was so consistent. And another guy who just puts in a ton of time during the offseason getting to know him. I mean, he would travel up to, I think, to the South Bend area or to the Elkhart area just to work out, get in the gym, and mm-hmm. face some top competition. And that really – he was just so consistent over the course of his career. And great, 130, great hair, too. Yeah. <laughs> 138, I'm going to go with a Rochester kid, a sophomore, DJ Basham. Uh, DJ is a really talented young athlete. He had a winning record, 18 and 16. Um, you know, he, he's maybe not quite as experienced as some of the other Rochester kids, but he, he gained a lot of experience this year. And, um, he, you know, he's a very agile athlete, very good on his feet. We'll see him during track season. Um, he's he, he's definitely an up-and-comer, and it's going to be exciting to see what he does over the next two years. Mm-hmm. At 145, we went with Tyler Tankersley from Winnemac. Tyler uh, has wrestled a little bit at 138 during the year, but he, uh, we put him at 145 because that's where he wrestled it during the postseason. Uh, you know, a very, very, you know, the, those Tankersleys at Winnemac, just a consistent, yeah. uh, tough-minded, tough, hard-nosed kids from Winnemac right. over the course of his career. Tyler, I think, uh, was a regional qualifier. 152, Grayson Guard of Rochester, semi-state qualifier, got within one win of making the state finals just like – Ethan Holloway, Grayson is just kind of that. He, he's not afraid to get down and dirty with you, and he and uh, it's it's going to be a, it's a it's a long six minutes when you wrestle him because he's he's very good and kind of rolling around, but he's also he's also improved at his um, on his feet a little bit. Um, you know he he's just a, he's just a tough matchup. I mean, I just remember him wrestling that kid from Manchester in the sectional. I'm like, how is he going to beat this kid? And like. And he just attacked his legs. I mean, he, he's always got, he's always got an idea of what he wants to do, and then he kind of executes his plan. Yeah, that's uh, one of those uh, things too. You'd expect him to be really smart wrestler, being a, a coach's kid. Yeah, at one sixty and one seventy, and I, I almost view Brendan Day and Caleb Good as kind of almost like uh, two of the same. I mean, both seniors, both kids who, you know, Brendan I think started his career at one thirty two, got one up at one sixty. Caleb, I think at 152, wound up at 170. Um, kids who were just, you know, very loyal to the Winnemac program. Um, you know, Caleb, uh, uh, Brendan, I think made re- regional. Caleb, I think made semi-state. Uh, just, you know, when you look at that Winnemac run of four straight uh, conference championships, those are two of the guys you think of when you think of Winnemac and those really good teams. Mm-hmm. 182, boy, this was this was tough. Because we had three really good kids in our area. When you talk about um, Brandon Hammer and um, Logan Smith, and uh, uh, there was, it could have gone either way. I went with Brandon Hammer. I don't know. You thought Brandon is just a kid who was just he was so strong. He, I mean, he he got within one win in the state finals. He he did it against all kinds of competition too. Mm-hmm. Um, 
strong, but also smart, you know, really and really good at once he got his position on you, it was you couldn't get him out of his position. I mean, just a really, really tough kid. You you were heartbroken for him. I mean, he loses a state his semi state ticket match in overtime. I mean one break the other way and he might have gone to state just like Basley Owens did. So mm-hmm. a great career for Brandon. But that could have been in another any under another different way. But a one ninety five, Alex Deming from Rochester. He went from a regional qualifier as a freshman to a state qualifier as a sophomore. Um, a kid who's just, you know, built like a built like a rock. <laughs> and um you know, he's really good on his feet. And and it's kind of it's kind of one of those things where kind of the physical where you develop physically and then kind of the confidence kind of comes with it. And I mean, you cannot move him around very often. I mean, we I mean he, I mean he took he did not back down from 195 was a tough weight class in this area, and he did not back down from any challenge. I mean, uh, you know, I mean Basley Owens at 195. We we had him as honorable mention, and Alex beat him three times. Mm-hmm. And Basley is a tough tough kid. Yeah. So, you know, Alex's win over Washburn from Kokomo in the regional final, that was another one of those matches of the year. I mean, Washburn's a tough, you know, state qualifier previously, another really tough kid. And for Alex to win that, um, only and Alex is only going to get even better. Right, just a sophomore. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, he, he's not maybe the, the, the pin artist. He's not going to pin a guy in 30 seconds, but he's just going to work you over. And you are just, it's not a fun six minutes to wrestle. Mm-hmm. Alex Deming, a 220, Brady back. You know, Brady's always been a great defensive wrestler. I think this year he kind of kept the defense and added some offense. And he wound up finishing sixth at state. He's got every move in the book. And he's, you know, he's 220, but he's mobile like a like a 145 pounder. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's, and he's, he's just very, he's just a very, very good instinctive wrestler. And he's, he wrestles with so much confidence out there, and he was just so consistent. I think he he lost. I mean, he lost four matches all year, but all four were to state qualifiers, including two from the Adam the the Adam Central kid, Hierley. He was just a he, he was just a beast. Mm-hmm. I mean, he, and then he lost to Grange from Penn, who was the state runner up, and he lost to Carroll from Christian Carroll, who was from New Prairie, but now has since transferred yeah. to Jimtown. Right. But Christian Carroll was the state champion, so he lost to the state champion. The run of state runner up and the guy who finished in fifth place. Mm-hmm. Those were his four twice. Those were his four losses. I mean, Brady is just he's he is an elite wrestler at the state. Mm-hmm. And then at heavyweight, Marshall. Yeah. And and Brady's just a sophomore too, right? And Brady's just a sophomore. Yeah. So they're gonna have uh, mm-hmm. more to come from him. And that's kind of an odd situation uh, with Carroll. Uh, that's his third school, I believe, in high school. Right, he was in Illinois for a while. Well, that'd be his fourth. Then he was. Yeah. He was. Uh, where was he at before uh, New Prairie? I think he was. Was he at Chesterton? Maybe I don't. Or in, I don't. I, I'm. That's guessing. I think. I thought he was in a South Bend school, and then he right. moved to, to New Prairie. No, he he's a junior. He didn't participate in IHSA wrestling as a freshman. I think because he was living in Illinois and going to school there at the time. Okay. So yeah, that's kind of a strange thing. So. Now, uh, you know, obviously that's a tremendous, I mean, a lot of Rochester kids there, and, and that tells you, you know, just how good that Rochester right. team was eight, and, and eight. is going to be because there's a lot of young Rochester kids on that list. Yeah, eight ro- eight Rochester kids on that list, and uh, how many seniors? Uh, one. Marshall. Mm-hmm. He was the only senior out of the eight that we picked Yeah, for the first team. Is Holloway? Ethan's a junior. Junior, okay. Yeah, yeah. So he'll be back. So yeah, it's a uh, quite a uh, list, and uh, you know, and then you go down and you look in the honorable mention. There's uh, there's some more Rochester zebras there as well. Right. I mean, you know, Joey Spencer. You know, he you know made it to regionals for the second straight year. Joey's a, a really good kid who we we didn't talk about as much. Um, you know, one sixty Gavin McKee. I, I thought about him a lot mm. for the first team. I mean, he. Gavin had a very good year. Um, you know, we picked, uh, I think, uh, three Valley kids. You know, a Galvin Shambaugh at 120, a ba- you know, Baisley at 195, and Dalton Albert at 220. Dalton was a kid who made it to semi-state as a as a sophomore. Mm-hmm. A real kid who really came on. Uh, maybe not quite at Brady Beck's level, but Dalton's really t- – he, he's not fun to wrestle either. Mm-hmm. And, 
you know, Peyton Schnurpel at Pioneer. Great to see Peyton Schnurpel and Logan Smith, 170 and 182, both made it to semi-state. Happy for them because, remember, they both got quarantined last year and right. were not able to compete at the regional. Yeah. So great to see them both make semi-state. Um, I saw Logan at um, at state. He was, I know he, he travels a lot down to Peru during the off seasons to to work with some of the Peru kids okay. and get better. So congrats to him. Um, uh, Quinn Kelly uh, from Caston is a kid who came on, uh, started his career at Rochester, then moved on to Caston. And uh, Garrison Hickel at heavyweight, another Caston kid, Garrison is just a mountain of a man. It was just a lot of fun to watch wrestle. Yeah. You know, I, I look at that list, 182, Logan Smith, like you talked about there from Pioneer. Mm -hmm. I mean, he would be at the top of a lot of lists. You got Basley Owens at 195, who was a state qualifier last year. Yeah. You look who's in front of him on our list, and, you know, yeah. it, it's, it's hard to put him on top of those guys. I, I'd go to battle with a lot of these kids. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I, Ivan Callender at Culver had a great year, too. Eli Nickel, a very promising freshman from Pioneer, we picked an honorable mention at 145. Mm -hmm. And Philip Crippen, you can probably put him in with Brendan Day and Caleb Good, and and even uh, I know Sean Pratt. Sean Pratt, he's another kid. I mean, we picked Ethan Holloway at 120. We picked Galvin Shambaugh at honorable mention. Sean Pratt, <laughs> we didn't have room for Sean Pratt on our team. He just signed with Trine University right. from Winnemac. So, right. and he's another kid from Winnemac who was just kind of was that veteran kid. He was just another key linchpin to that that great run that Winamax had over these last three or four years. Yeah, and it's not a slight to him by any means. It's just, uh, you know, this is just such a strong list. Yeah. It's just, you know, it's, it takes a lot to make that list. And, right. You know, you see a lot of Rochester Zebras on there because, you know, you look at that team who, you know, look at what they did. I mean, just... Right. I mean, C Caleb Schaefer was a semi-state qualifier. We didn't have room for him. Mm -hmm. and I And I felt terrible for that, but I... At 182, I think we had to go with Hammer and Smith before Caleb, and I and I hated that. I thought I thought uh, I thought Eli Swango had a great year at 170, but again, it's this we we want to make it a tough list. Yeah, tough list to get on, and uh, these are your uh, all RTC wrestling first team and honorable mention picks for 2021 and 2022. I have a feeling it's going to be even harder to make the list next year. Right, it's mm -hmm. not going to get any easier, mm -hmm. and uh, you know Rochester Zebras—they're uh, going to have a lot to say about that. And mm -hmm. you know, there's some really good up-and-coming wrestlers over at Valley as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, like you said, there's some young, young up-and-coming wrestlers at uh, at Pioneer, and of course, Winnemac—they always uh, have a great wrestling program. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, Cullen Day does a great job with that program, and he's—I I wouldn't be surprised if there's a new crop on its way. So let's take a uh, quick break here, and uh, we'll get ready, and we'll talk about our basketball teams here in just a moment on Talking Sports with Val. This Federal Savings Bank has offered mortgage lending for 55 years, and now we're also offering commercial lending. We offer loans for real estate, equipment, and business lines of credit. First Federal Savings Bank, your locally owned community bank for all your business banking needs. You aren't just a number at First Federal Savings Bank, you're part of our community. Contact Lindy Breeden, our business lending expert, for all of your business banking needs. And remember, we don't want to be the biggest bank, just the best. Welcome back here. We're talking sports with Val, and we're going through our all RTC uh, picks. We've been through the boys and girls swimming teams, and we went, went through our wrestling team. And uh, let's move on. Let's talk some girls basketball and you know, we talked about, you know, some of the teams picking the, the top player of the year was a little bit tougher than others. I'm, uh, I'm guessing that uh, not a whole lot of uh, sleepless, uh, you know, we, we, we went right with the wrestling with uh, Fishback. Yeah. I, I think that uh, uh, everybody will agree that the uh, top girls basketball player of the uh, area and uh, one of the top players in the state mm -hmm. uh, was in our area, and uh, that's, of course... Miss Brooke. Ashlyn was just sensational all year. We saw it from game one against Tri-County, and she just basically kept it up that pace the whole year. And you're going to see just kind of, I mean, the whole different highlight package, it's, it's different highlights, whether it's her scoring. She could score in close to the basket. She could hit the, th yeah, she led the state in three-pointers, but in a lot of ways it was the mid-range game that, that really kind of impressed me in, in terms of how that developed. 
Oh, yeah, and she was a great passer, too. Yeah, one of the top uh, assist uh, getters in the state. Mm -hmm. She sees passes that that others just couldn't find. And, and maybe another thing that, that kind of just getting to know Ashlyn, what a competitor she is as well. Oh, yeah. I mean, she is just a fierce competitor. And what she did, you know, again, I wasn't at the Carroll game. You were at the Carroll game, the sectional final. But what she did, I mean, almost she scored, what, 31 points in the second half? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And she had 37 for the game. But what a fierce competitor she is as well. Yeah. Definitely. And, uh, you know, we, we've been kind of looking at this situation with her the last couple of years, obviously, with the injuries. What could a healthy Ashlyn Brooke do for an entire mm -hmm. season? And this is what she can do. You know, yeah. 25 plus points a game led the state in scoring. Uh, one of the top assist uh, getters in the state as well. Led and the state in three pointers. Led the state in three pointers. She had, almost 12, had, three. She had 12 threes in a game against Peru. Yeah. And uh, she was right up there with uh, steals as well, almost four a game in in, uh, in the steal category, too. Yeah. And she made the junior All-Stars. Yeah. So that's just a phenomenal accomplishment. She'll be playing, It's I think it's June 8th, in, a, in an exhibition game against the senior All-Stars. They haven't said when or where that game will be played yet. But, mm -hmm. I mean, if you make the junior All-Stars, that's that's quite an accomplishment. And, uh you know she's and then she, and then she she verbally committed to Ball State, so yeah. it's been quite an eventful winter for Ashland and and uh, just full of accomplishments and you know that Pioneer team I think went with twenty one and five, four twenty one and four mm -hmm. after losing you know three starters to graduation. Yeah, yeah, you forget about and and not only three starters but three very good starters. Mm -hmm. You know with Joe Walker and Blickenstaff and uh, uh, Brooke, her, her older sister. sister. Yeah, yeah so. Yeah, and that's a, you know, they're obviously going to have some adjustments with uh, mm -hmm. Haley Kripe graduating, you know, not to not take anything away from Haley Kripe, who was her player of the year last year, and she's still playing, you know, this mm -hmm. year. And uh, But, uh, yeah, Ashlyn was just, uh, she's just a, one of those special players. You know, we did a lot of those games, and I did a lot of those games, and just some of the things that she can do, is you just don't see girls basketball players do. Right, some of the... Her handle is just beyond mature mm -hmm. for her age. Mm -hmm. I mean, kind of that yo-yo dribble. I mean, she doesn't she doesn't just dribble into a crowd. I mean, she she kind of navigates her handle very well, and then she uses that to get to her shot. She uses the high ball. You know, Pioneer uses the screen and roll better than most uh, in any basketball team, girls or boys, that we see mm -hmm. every year. And it's it's kind of amazing to watch. In fact, mm -hmm. that's something you almost see at the pro level. Yeah. And you talk about, like you said, all three levels. I mean, three-pointer, mid-range, uh, getting to the basket, you know. Yeah. And, and she can finish at a high level at all three areas. Right, right. Kind of a creative finisher at the rim, which is not a lot of kids are at. It's, just, it's, it's a combination of fundamentals and just great instinct and great joy for the game, great yeah. love of the game, great instincts for the game, and kind of a great feel for the game. Let's take a look at who we have joining her on the first, second, and honorable mention teams. Well, Haley Kripe, uh, you know, she averaged 18 points a game. I mean, for, you know, if you if you kind of, I mean, I can't imagine there are there are 40 better players in the state than Haley Kripe. Just one of them happens to be her own teammate. But mm -hmm. I mean, she averaged 18 a game. She, I think, she averaged what about eight or nine rebounds a game. She was averaging a double double for a while. You know, she was a great, you know, three point shooter, but she was also great in transition. And she was maybe the best individual defender in our area. I mean, she kind of, whenever somebody on the other team got hot, that's who Haley would then kind of gravitate toward and would start guarding. And uh, you got to imagine that if Haley Kripe wanted to, uh, she could probably have played D1 basketball somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously, you know, her first love is, is on the softball diamond, uh, going to go play at, at Kansas University next year. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, but right. just a just a amazing athlete in in all three of the sports that she played and uh you know what a great young lady as well i mean just you know she she took uh you know she took my daughter under her wing and and mm -hmm. you know didn't have to it didn't have to be nice to her and, and she just uh, a super uh, great young lady mm -hmm. and she you know she you know she she always you know she ran the court so she would always get a couple fast break baskets during the game but she was also a really good three-point shooter and uh, you know she was the leading rebounder on the team. As yeah, well, and so. the leading rebounder. So yeah. at five, 
six, five, seven. Yeah, five, six. Yeah. 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 So I mean, she just had a fantastic year. Caden Smollett from Valley, uh, you know, averaged 17 points a game. Uh, Ashley Brooke was first in the state in threes. Caden Smollett was fourth, mm -hmm. 75 three-pointers, and broke the Valley single-season school record with those 75 three-pointers. She broke the record of Caden Smollett last year. Her last I, think had 60, I think had 66 or 67 last year. So Caden says one of those people, I mean, you know, and it was funny because you'd see other coaches and they'd just throw their clipboard down on the ground like, why can't, like, I told you, don't let her get open for three, and yet she always would pick her spot. She she knew where to get open, and yeah. she had that quick, you know, she had that kind of unique release. But it was a quick release, and they they couldn't stop it. And if you give her just an inch of daylight, she was pretty much automatic. I mean, she couldn't kind of create her own shot off the dribble the way maybe Ashton can. But I mean, just in terms of it being a spot up shooter, she was just deadly. Mm -hmm. uh, Lizzie Edmonds from Argus. You know, the, the more you watch girls basketball, the more you realized how Lizzie's shot blocking was so unique. Mm -hmm. There just aren't girls who can do what Lizzie does. And again, the, the, the memory I'll always have of Lizzie will be that Fort Wayne Blackhawk game in the regional semifinal. The shot, the block shot at the end of the game, I mean, that is, that was just sensational, and you just don't see any girls do that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Lizzie had had a problem in her previous years with foul trouble. That wasn't really much of an issue this year. I think she fouled out of like one or two games all year. Yeah. You know, she cut down on her fouls while still being an impact defensive player. And she averaged, I think, was it 12, 13 points a game mm -hmm. on a team with pretty balanced scoring. She could score in the post. She can hit that mid-range jump shot. And she was a good ball handler, too. Yeah. She's going to be going to uh, Holy Cross, playing for Tom Robbins next year. Mm -hmm. Really looking forward to uh, to seeing how she does up there. That's, a you know, Coach Robbins is I, I've been impressed with what he's done at Holy Cross, for mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, he, he's a very well-organized coach, and I think Lizzie will really thrive there. Mm -hmm. And then the fifth choice, um, Isabel Scales, uh, you know, um, the leading scorer on a, on, a, on a really, really good team, you know, kind of that lead, the, kind of that traditional lead guard role. Um, but she, at the same time, she didn't really have to score to have a big impact on her game because she was to have a big impact on the game. You know, she was a really good defender um, in Coach Douglas's man defense. That toughness that he's brought to the program, Isabel, uh, she kind of uh, personifies that. Mm -hmm. And you know, but, you know, Bell, she improved her shooting as well. I mean, she was pretty tough. You know, if you didn't, you didn't want her to get open from three point range either. Yeah. Maybe not at Brooke or Malott's level, but Bell was, yeah, she was she was very good three point shooter as well. But could also drive to the basket and score. Yeah, but, I, you know, you talk about the toughness that uh, yeah. Coach Douglas brought to the team. I, I think a lot of that came with her as well. Yeah, yeah. They came in at the same time. Right. And Coach Douglas, he, he emphasized tempo a lot more this year, while Bell was the one who pushed that tempo. Mm -hmm. uh, second team, we picked five for the second team, Corinna Stiles from Valley. What an improvement she made from last year to this. Uh, only a junior, and, I mean, kind of a – Kind of a unique player, and it was kind of, I think it maybe took a little while to figure out, okay, wh what's her role? What does she do well, and how does it fit in with the rest of the team? But for a, a six-footer to be a really good passer like that, I mean, she had a, I think she had a couple of 20-plus rebound games. I think she was second in the TRC in rebounding. Um, and then, you know, she, she didn't hit a ton of threes, but, boy, it seemed like every one of them was timely. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, the, and I always think of those three big three pointers she hit against Rochester. I think she'd hit three three pointers in her career. Mm -hmm. Prior to that, she'd three three pointers in that game, and really became more comfortable shooting from the outside. And and you know, and but not only that, but she can put the ball on the floor and dribble to the basket and, and score. How many six footers can do that? Mm -hmm. So um, Corinna just had a great year. Maddie Smith. I mean, we saw Maddie, you know, develop as a as a. You know, I mean, Co Coach Douglas said, boy, Maddie could average about 15 points a game this year. And I was like, really? <laughs> and he was right. I mean, Maddie, you know, her post game, I mean, she was just so strong. If she got in the right block, good luck. Because mm -hmm. you would get buried in the post. But not only that, but she's got quick feet, too. I mean, she's strong, but she's got good agility and quickness as well. And what a year Maddie had. And her improvement was fun to watch over the course of her career. Oh, yeah. I, I just remember uh, that game at the Cass County Tournament mm -hmm. against Pioneer with her. And, uh, you know, it was a kind of an epic game between uh, Maddie Smith and, and Ashlyn. 
uh, just kind of going at it, you know, in different yeah. ways. But the you know, Matty uh, almost single handedly won that game for Caston. Right. And uh, it, it took a heroic effort from Ashland and from Haley to to win that game. You know, and I was at that Caston North White game in the sectional final. North White's defense, they looking back at that, it wasn't so much designed to stop Scales. It was designed to stop Smith. Mm-hmm. I mean, they, she was double and triple teamed as soon as she caught the ball. They were just determined not to let her beat them, and I think that's a sign of ultimate respect. Mm-hmm. Lexi Thomas from Rochester, we've talked about Lexi's leadership and her courage going through that hip problem. I think she had her first hip surgery this week. She's got another one coming up in a couple of weeks that's kind of the more major surgery, but you know, when Lexi was healthy, she was pretty much a walking double double. Mm-hmm. And you know, when when kind of when they were struggling, it was always throw the ball to Lexi and let's see her go to work. She was much much better at finishing around the rim this year than I think in previous years. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she just uh, you know personified grit. Yeah, I mean the hard the hardest working player on the court in just about any game she played. Yeah, yeah, I mean, and and that was something that she brought to the court every game every year and. And that, that just shows you, uh, you know, with, like you said, that surgery, and she's going to have to have another one. Uh, you know, she she just played through it. And, mm-hmm. you know, we, we knew she was hurting, but we didn't know how bad she was hurting. Yeah. So, uh, you know, just a tough, tough kid. Yeah, and yeah, and, and an, a, an elite rebounder at, you know, 5'10", maybe? Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, somebody you can count on for double-digit rebounds a game. Rose Peterson of Culver. Um, Rose was, you know, you, you could tell right away that she, coming in from Granger Christian, that she was, she kind of had a good feel, good instincts for the game. I mean, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll always remember the 37 point game against Triton in the sexual, but she had a 29 point game, I think, against Lakeland Christian earlier in the year. Mm-hmm. Um, really quick release on that shot, mm-hmm. which is, uh, and just, well, she just does everything quick. Mm-hmm. I mean, and I think she she averaged about three or four steals a game as well on defense. So she's going to be a tough one-on-one defender. You know, I think we talked a little bit about Culver at the end of the season. What's Rose's role going to be next year? Is she going to be more of a point guard or more of a two guard? Because I think she can play both positions. Yeah, I think so. And uh, you know, it's going to be interesting to see you throw in those younger kids that were uh, you know really helping them out late in the year, and mm-hmm. it should be interesting. Yeah. And then uh, the last spot this the. Bella Stoltz, we went with Bella Stoltz. It was a very close call. There was a lot of really good kids we thought about, but I thought Bella, because of her as a two-way player, offense mm-hmm. and defense. Mm-hmm. I mean, just to, you know, and, and not only that, but she could play. I mean, she could almost play the two, the three, or the four. Uh, you know, with Lizzie playing the five, I don't think she needed to play. They didn't need her to play that, but she can play the two, the three, or the four. Could guard any, but any two or three or four. She can guard on the perimeter. She could guard in the post. You know, she she was the second leading rebounder of the team, which is saying something on a team with Lizzie on it. Just a really tough defender, and then kind of improved her scoring. She averaged about nine points a game. Yeah, and she kind of, you know, she can hit the outside shot, but she's got a post up game as well. She's kind of sneaky big too, because you 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 look at her next to Lizzie, and and you don't think you know, okay, she's she's as big as she is, but she's very long mm-hmm. and uh, super athletic. Yeah, and then honorable mention, boy. The, We'd go to war with a lot of these girls as sure. well. Riley sure. Holloway, a uh, great three-point shooter. Samantha Redinger, um, you know, just continued, you know, another two-way guard at Argus. Addison Zimpleman, she's, you know, really developed as a complete player. I think we've always thought of Addison as a shooter, but she's much more than that. I mean, she's a very good passer as well, um, good defender. Yeah. Uh, Millie Scorsone, one of the best pro- post players in the area. Uh, there were games when Millie carried Rochester. Mm-hmm. Uh, Kingsley Croft, a great three-point shooter. I think she set the Winnipeg single-season record for threes. Uh, Cammie Burkett from Rochester. Her defense and leadership were, were just huge after the injury to Emma Houdeshell. Um Emma Dunlap from Argus really matured into a point guard this year. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, well, and Cammie, too, sorry, but, mm-hmm. uh, you know, her injury, too. I mean, yeah. you know, the two seniors for Rochester, I mean, just their, their gutsy play at the end of the year. Yeah. I mean, she was able to uh, to not only play on a torn ACL, but uh, you know she was still playing at a high level on yeah. the torn ACL. Yeah, it, it amazed everybody, including Brian Jennings, mm-hmm. uh, Emma Dunlap, who you know grew into a really good point guard as the the year progressed, and really I think kind of sacrificed a little bit of scoring to help her others get some points. Yeah, and I'm I'm really looking forward to Emma's senior year. I think she's going to have a great great senior year along mm-hmm. with Bella. 
Uh, Bailey Harness from Caston, uh, just kind of a do-it-all player. Really good, you know, another two-way player. Good, you know, good good defender, good rebounder. And then you look up at the end of the day, it was like, wow, Bailey Harness had 10 points. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, I mean, she's, she scored two, and you didn't have to call a play for her, mm-hmm. for her to get her 10 points. Mm-hmm. Kaya Campbell from Winnemac, kind of a great floor general from Winnemac, and she could also hit the three. Kennedy Jackson from Rochester, another player who's kind of defies position. I mean, is she? She's kind of a post. She's kind of a forward. She can handle the ball. She could score in the post. Yeah. She's a good rebounder. Um, knows how to play the game. Uh, Kennedy was just had a great year. Yeah, I mean, she played. Uh, she played wing for him. Yeah. You know, quite a bit as well, and and could handle the ball and and help with the press. And and, th- and that was so important because when you have it, it gave Coach Jennings more f- lineup flexibility. Mm-hmm. When you have both Lexi and Millie out there as well, so mm-hmm. Molly Moriarty from Valley really took over that point guard spot, and you know um, she was, I think, uh, you know, she, I think she was the third leading scorer on the team after um, Malott and Styles, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, had, but again, another, you know, she could score, but I think, I think as the season kind of progressed, she she kind of f- focused more on setting up her teammates, and she was also a really good defender, really quick on her feet. Great year for Molly, and it's going to be fun to watch her. She's only a junior. Yeah, I mean, she's one of them that, you know, if you would have said at the beginning of the year she's going to be on that list, you you probably would have said that you're nuts because Mm -hmm. uh, I would give her our, uh, if we had one, I would give her the the most improved award. Because from where she was at the beginning of the year to to where she is now, it's just night and day, really. Yeah, from I mean, she had a good year at the JV last year and then kind of showed her skills this year. Mm -hmm. And you think Malat? Styles and Moriarty will all be back next year. Mm-hmm. Grace Sieber from Culver, you know, a girl who could hit the three, but I think could also handle the ball and be kind of a point guard. Mm-hmm. So we talked about the relationship between her and Peterson as kind of a really unique guard combo at Culver. Brooklyn Borges from Pioneer, um, not a big time scorer, but a really strong shot blocker and rebounder mm-hmm. uh, and defender. Uh, Ky- Kylie Attinger from Pioneer, kind of in that same boat. Uh, again, they didn't need her to score. I wouldn't be surprised if she did increase her scoring next year. Um, just played with you could just see the confidence that she was just teaming with as the season went on, and I think was playing as well as she, at the end of the season as well as she had at any time. Yeah, yeah, we talked about Kylie a lot because uh, her, along with Molly, probably would have fought for that most improved because if you look at Kylie from her freshman year of JV to uh, what she did this year, uh, you know, very much improved, and uh, really looking forward to seeing couple more years of that yeah and then ellie gearhart from winnemac a senior who was just kind of a you know she she could score but she could pass as well Mm -hmm. uh you know started off she was a softball player that was playing basketball but uh you know she's truly a basketball player yeah yeah really kind of broadened her fundamentals Mm -hmm. skills over the course of the season and over the course of her career so uh, that's the all rtc first team second team and honorable mention and as you can see i mean you know, there's a there's a lot of kids that uh, you know could have made that list that that didn't. Uh, same as the wrestling. I mean, there's there's a lot of really good girls basketball mm-hmm. players in our area, and, mm-hmm. and really looking forward to uh, the next couple of years to to see how this all comes together. And you know, obviously Rochester is going to be looking for a new coach to to see you know who's going to lead them. Winnemac is also going to be looking for a new coach. So mm-hmm. uh, it's going to be interesting next year to see how this goes. Yeah, but I mean, we, you know, it, it was, you know, I mean, obviously the the team of the year was we don't give that out, but Argus, what do you, I mean, for the, for the the way they, the way they took it to another level, mm-hmm. and I think I think it goes for some reason I, I think of that Northwestern game where they were right there with the with a four A team that wound up winning their sectional, yeah, with a team with a Big Ten player on it, and they were right there with a minute to go in the game, and just kind of the leadership and confidence they built over the over the year. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was it was it's fun to watch it was fun to watch it's kind of what makes this job rewarding right yeah it was an exciting season uh you know and and obviously we got a chance to follow Argus into uh the regional round and and you know like you said that was a big win in the morning game against Black Hawk and mm-hmm. uh you know they gave North White you know maybe they kind of ran out of a little gas but uh you know uh they had an opportunity there North White was a team that you know, almost won the semi-state. So. Right, yeah. North White, I think, was just better. Yeah. Just a, yeah, I mean, a senior-laden team there with North White. But, yeah. Uh, 
I think, you know, I said it before, I think it was kind of a, a flip-flop of the 2016 situation where North White had to give everything they had to beat Marquette in that morning game, and then they were out of gas against Argus in that championship, and I mm -hmm. think it was kind of the same thing. Right. And I'm, the, the, the current group of Argus freshmen, they'll be sophomores next year. I think they're going to have a role on next year's team, and I, I'm, really, I'm really intrigued to see how they then mix in with Stoltz, Dunlap, and Redinger. Mm -hmm. Hopefully and, can... and Fajardo. Right. Hopefully they can get some numbers going there. Mm -hmm. They, you know, struggled with numbers this year, even with the, you mm -hmm. know, they didn't quite have a, a full JV roster. So maybe they can get mm -hmm. some numbers going there. So that's our uh, our girls team now. Uh, as easy as our top pick was for the girls in uh, wrestling, this uh, next one was probably the one that you probably lost lost the most sleep over. I would say. Yeah, this one I think I won about four or five different ways. Uh, uh, now this guy, maybe this guy, maybe this guy. Mm -hmm. No, and then I finally decided. I, f I finally just put a deadline on myself. I said I've got to pick, I've got to pick somebody right now. And I, I went with. I, I'm pretty confident that I got it. That we have a very very strong person here. The 2021 2022 boys basketball player of the year for the RTC All Area Team is none other than junior. J.J. Morris from Argus. Yeah, J.J.'s the call, and maybe maybe he just made a last great impression because the last game of the year we did was Argus against Triton in the sectional final, and J.J. was a man in that game. Mm -hmm. I mean, Triton played him tough and physical, and yet J.J. still put up 16 points on the board. And I think it was just his overall game. I mean, you can see him shooting threes. You can see him scoring in transition. He's got that little hook shot, which is just impossible to block. He's got some face-up game. He's got the mid-range game. He can hit the three. Yeah. And then he can drive to the basket and score. On cue. <laughs> He's got a floater. Mm -hmm. I, I finally, and I think I talked about, about this in the article, is if it would tie game with 10 seconds to go and I really needed a bucket and I could pick any player in our area to score that bucket or to take that shot, I think I would go with J.J. Yeah. I would uh, I would definitely agree with you. I kind of uh, gave you that uh, you know mm -hmm. the nod as far as I, I thought mm -hmm. that was uh, who I would pick as well. And but you, you look at the the right. He averaged 16 points a game on a team with pretty balanced scoring. Right. With other, with other scoring options, he didn't have to carry them. Right. I you know I think in a lot of teams he would he, he, if he if he were asked to average 20, I think he could have done it. Yeah, he might uh, he might have that role next year mm -hmm. you know, with the with the seniors they lost, but. Uh, as far as this goes, and then you look at who joins him here on the list, um, probably four out of those five uh, were right there on the top of your tongue uh, as far as all player of the year. Yeah, I mean, Tate Kaiser was somebody we really, really thought long and hard about. Tate was just a great two-way guard. Mm -hmm. And he just, I mean, you saw him, we saw him early in the season, like, boy, you, you can tell he's, he's, he's just a different kid than mm -hmm. when he his earlier stint at Valley, and then you saw him just get better and better and better. Not only that, he was a two-way player. I mean, he, I mean, he'd have games where he'd score 15 or 20, but also he could stop the other guy. You know, the the, the leading scorer, the leading scorer on the other team, the best scoring guard on the other team. Mm -hmm. He could guard that guy. He was physically tough, mentally tough, and he just kind of symbolized the improvement in that Valley program as they won 14 games this year. Yeah, or he was one of the guys I'd say. Oh yeah, for sure. And you know, we did a game early in the season up at Calder with them, and you know, like you said, mm -hmm. uh, you could see there were some things there. But he was still trying to get his uh, footing underneath him with him being back at Valley. And uh, the difference between that game and then when we did the uh, Rochester game later mm -hmm. in the year, I mean, he definitely was was on solid footing. Right. And, I mean, think about that Northwood team that was ranked in the top five all year when they're sectional. I mean, Tate put up 19 points on that team that mm -hmm. had two really, really good guards, maybe, I mean, definitely college guards, maybe Division One guards. Mm -hmm. But Tate put up 19 points in that game. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we, I, I just thought he was kind of their MVP. He was kind of their, the guy who made the engine run there. Yeah. But Nolan Cumberland was right there, too. Sure. And Nolan averaged 13 points a game. And Nolan, again, for a 6'4 kid, I mean, his handle is just awesome. Mm -hmm. And he And he kind of... You know, he, he kind of had that mature kind of, we talk about the Ashland Brook. I mean, Nolan's kind of, he kind of knew where to where to bring the dribble and where not to bring the dribble. And he could score off the dribble. And, it, I mean, just all, that 
coming up, he was just awesome off the baseline. That that baseline drive is basically unstoppable. And all that, and then Nolan kind of worked on his three point shooting, and that got better. Mm-hmm. And so you can't you can't back off him and just let him shoot threes. You got to get out on him, and when he get out on him, then he drives by you. Mm-hmm. So he's just uh, a quick, you know, lanky, agile athlete with good instincts, and also I think he's like an 85% for 80, 85% free throw shooter. I mean, mm-hmm. he's the guy who made probably more clutch free throws than anybody on Valley's team. Yeah. So, I mean, he was a guy I think we thought long and hard about. Sure. And then another guy we thought long and hard about, <laughs> really Joey yeah. Spin, who led Caston in scoring and assists on a team of balanced scoring, but, I mean, nobody scored more. I mean, we talked about in theory, J.J. would be the guy we'd want to shoot with 10 seconds to go. I think J- my, Joey Spin might have made more clutch baskets than any player in our area. Mm-hmm. And he was a guy who could score off the dribble and then worked on his three-point shot. And he became almost automatic. You left him with a wide-open three. I mean, he was – so if you put more attention if, – if you said, well, you can't, you can't run off Cade Zider, well, Joey was like, okay, fine. Mm-hmm. I'll just take you to the basket or I'll shoot over you. Yeah, and he's just a a very and he's a freak athlete too. Mm-hmm. I mean, so I, I still think about you know all those big buckets he scored against North White in that sectional game. I know they lost the game, but you know the big buckets he scored against Triton in that big win, the big buckets he scored against North Judson in that win. I mean, Joey was just a great, great had just a great, great year, and he maybe he's another guy who would have scored fifteen or twenty a game if that's what they needed from him. Right, and then, you know that was a casting team that was not afraid to make that extra pass, and and that you know probably hurt his scoring average, but mm-hmm. it didn't hurt Castings. Yeah, I mean they were able to uh, to win a lot of games. Obviously, win in the conference undefeated. Mm-hmm. You know that's a, that's a huge accomplishment because you know at the beginning of the year we're talking uh, Triton and North Judson. Yeah, you know Casting was maybe on the tip of our tongue, but not coming out of our mouth as far as a right. conference right. Uh, contender, and and they they came in and they got it done. Yeah. <laughs> And just, uh, yeah, I mean, and, and a very good defensive player as well. And then Michael Richard from Argus. I mean, Michael is a two-way point guard, <laughs> a team leader, a floor general. You know, kind of uh, kind of morphed into it, went from a two-guard playing, you know, with Sam Manikowski mm-hmm. to being a point guard, maybe a different type of point guard than Sam, but a true floor general and a guy who, I mean, he was another guy who was not afraid of the big moment in the fourth quarter. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, you know, kind of a scoring point guard, but always seemed to save his biggest baskets for late in the game. Mm-hmm. But a good passer as well. Yeah. Uh, second team, boy, I, I'd go to I'd go to war with the second team. I was kind of like, wow, this is the second team. Right. Paul you, you Leisure. Put those, you put those five guys on the floor, and and you got a good team. Paul Leisure, thirteen points a game, and you know, a guy who I, I think I, I knew Paul was a good three point shooter. I didn't have to know that, but it, his mid range game. Mm-hmm. Was just really good. His footwork, his ability to get off a shot in traffic, that was really impressive. And another thing that impressed me about Paul was that he can play point guard if you need him to. Mm-hmm. And I think uh, he averaged about three, three and a half assists a game. And I mean, he it was him setting up Tarek McLaughlin as much as the other way around. Mm-hmm. Sam Smith, uh, you know, Sam is just a guy who I mean, he's always been strong, but he kind of refined his post moves. He's kind of very economical in the post. He's not gonna. He's not one of those guys who dribble, 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 and then toss up a hook shot. He, he goes up to the bucket really quick. He's kind of a combination of agility and strength. And, you know, he, I mean, Sam's, what, 6'1"? Mm-hmm. But it was never a problem for him to get off a shot against a kid who was 6'3 or 6'4". Yeah, no wasted motions. Yeah, no, yeah. yeah. So he's, you know, very efficient, a great team leader, um, and improved his free throw shooting this year, which is kind of a bugaboo for him, right. but he really yeah. improved his free throw shooting. Mason Herbert from Culver. Um, this was a kid who, I'll be honest, I didn't know who he was yeah. last summer. And he went from being a kid who I didn't know who he was to being their go-to scorer for the Cavaliers. I mean, mm-hmm. he had, I mean, he was just a deadly, you know, wing three-point shooter. And I, I think Mason, you know, as long as he stays healthy and works at it, he's only going to develop that post game as well. I mean, he's a legit. I, I interviewed him after that sectional game. He's a legit six three, six four. Mm-hmm. And I mean, he. He doesn't need a, a lot. I don't know if he's like a like a big time post score, but just doing a little bit of that will help out a lot, and will yeah. even create more opportunities for him. I thought Mason had a great year. Bryce Rudis, old cast, and I just loved watching Bryce play. Another two way player. Um, he step into that passing lane, get two or three steals a game. Mm-hmm. Um, he's another guy. You know, we talked about kind of Bailey Harness on the girls team at Cast, and Bryce was kind of the same way on the boys team. I think he averaged nine points a game. 
without them really ever having to call a play for him. Mm-hmm. I mean, he, he was very good moving away from the ball. Um, you know, he, he scored a couple, I mean, he scored a couple huge buckets in that North wide game in the sectional. Um, you know, he, he's a guy who was maybe 6'1", 6'2". Mm-hmm. I, I think they might have listed him at 6'3", but you look up at the end of the game, it's like, he's got 12 rebounds. It's like, whoa, yeah. Yeah. just a great energy player, just a great, I mean, just just a, a again, a, kind of a, a positionless player. I guess he was kind of a power forward, and Smith was the post, but it was the center. But Bryce is just a he's just a good basketball player. He can handle it a little bit, even. Yeah, yeah, he seems to have a, a really good basketball IQ uh, in the right place at the right time. Yeah. And a lot of that, and, and, and uh, his athletic ability is, you know, he's quick, mm-hmm. just you know, and long, yeah, longer than you would think. And then Russell Compton from Winnemac. Um, you know, a guy who could play the one or the two, he could shoot, he was quick. I think really, really improved his three-point shot this year. And so you, you couldn't just play him for the drive, but just a really good athlete, and and then he combined that with really good shooting. Mm-hmm. And then honorable mention, I mean, the, yeah, these kids were, this was a tough, because a lot of these kids could have made the, could have made the first or second team. I mean, Drew McKegg was just instant offense. He essentially was instant offense off the bench mm-hmm. uh, by the end of the year, but he, he excelled whether it was as a starter or as a reserve. Mm-hmm. Braden Shepard, um, a kid who, you know, he could you know he could score two points in a game, and you'd say he might have been the best player on the court because of his defense yeah. and his, abil- his abilities as a team leader. You know, had a, again, I think about what he did. I think he had, was it 20 or 22 against West Noble in the sectional? Yeah, it really picked up his scoring late. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Braden is just a—he was just a great team player. Mm-hmm. Kate Zider, you know, just a great three-point shooter, and just a, for his entire career, I mean, he made so many clutch three-pointers throughout throughout the year, and he was a guy who was just a great streak shooter. I mean, he could hit five or six in a game easily. Riley Shepard from Valley, sadly, his year ended early because of a broken ankle, but Riley mm-hmm. was just. Just a deadly corner three-point shooter, kind of, um, and I think he is a kid. You know, we talk about Mason Herbert. I think Riley is a game, kid who's only going to add some elements to his game. We know about the shooting, but uh, I mean, he, you know, he's a legit uh, six 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 seven, and he if he puts the ball on the deck and drives to the basket. I mean, boy, he's going to be a he and Cumberland are just going to be a nightmare to handle next mm-hmm. year because of, to have two athletic, tall wing guys yeah. like that. Tarek McLaughlin from Rochester. I mean, Tarek just a great, you know, just had a great feel for running the show. Um, averaged, I think, eight points a game. Um, you know, ha- again, a very good post-entry passer, which is something that we kind of take for granted. But it's, it's a really underrated skill. He could really, he could really get get his post guys and get his big guys involved on offense. Yeah. And uh, you know, I it kind of. I think playing with Paul kind of rubbed off on him because he was able to score kind of in traffic as the season went on. Mm-hmm. Um, certainly, I, I'd like to see him maybe shoot even more next year. That was, he, to score more. It's funny. I was just thinking that. I was like, the, the only thing I would fault Tarek on was I think he needs to go uh, a little bit more, uh, be more uh, selfish, I guess you would say, uh, you know, as far as looking for his own shot. Because mm-hmm. he's a little, uh, a little unselfish sometimes. And sometimes you think, you know, hey, you know, you need to kind of take this over. Yeah. Yeah. Christian Scott from Pioneer, he was the most athletic player in the Panthers. Mm-hmm. Uh, very good long rangey athlete who could drive to the bucket and score. Could hit that mid not, not really sh- didn't really shoot a lot of threes, but could score in the mid range, was a good defender as well. Very, very hard working player. Yeah. I mean, he would he would be all over the floor for sure. Yeah, he will be, yeah, really good year for him. Um Jake Stoltz, uh again, Jake is you know, I mean, he, he had some games where he really picked up his scoring, but the defense was always there mm-hmm. uh, with Jake. He um, was playing his best basketball at the end of the year. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dylan Kindig, uh, you know, Dylan is a you know a big guy who could step out and shoot the three, mm-hmm. uh, but all, could also score on the inside. Again, and then, you know, he'd average, you know, six, seven, eight rebounds a game. I mean, Dylan was just hugely important to what Argus did. Pretty good broadcaster too. Yeah, pretty yeah. good. Yeah, and he's got the a voice of the Argus Lady Dragon. Yeah. Uh, Tanner Reinhardt's from Rochester, um, freshman. Uh, again, kind of a stretch four. Mm-hmm. You don't really talk about stretch fours very often in high school basketball, and you don't talk about freshman stretch fours. Right. But a, a, you know, a six-two kid who was, you know, strong, built well, but could, could step out and shoot the three. I mean, I remember that Heritage game when he had five threes. Mm-hmm. Um, 
It'll be interesting to see him kind of expand his offensive game moving forward. Ethan Keller from Culver, a kid who didn't score a lot, but boy, his defense was key to what everything that our, that Culver did and what Coach Evans, you know, kind of believes. And I mean, uh, I mean, he played about 32 minutes a game every game, high energy on defense and a good passer. Mm -hmm. Teddy Redinger from Argus. Teddy was a great wing defender and could hit the occasional three pointer. Uh, Bo Brandt from Winnemac, kind of the the gritty guy on Winnemac's team. Uh, you know, Bo was maybe 6'1". I'm not even sure he was taller than Sam Smith, but a, get, a kid, I mean, he was a brand, so you know that he was going to take on whatever defensive assignment you, you threw his way, and he, he would handle it well. Mm -hmm. um, Oscar Solano from Pioneer. Oscar maybe had the biggest his the best game of his career right at the start of the season when they beat Logansport, and right. he had 17 points, and he had the game-winning free throw in that yep. game. Yep. But Oscar was a, you know, a, a kid who... Really, kind of improved his skill level, you know, uh, over the course of, over the course of the whole year. That's a pioneer team that had balance scoring all year, and uh, you know, Oscar could score in the post and was a good rebounder. Luke Honey from Rochester. He's another kid. I would not have imagined him uh, him being recognized on this team a year ago, but a kid who, uh, you know, he talked about kind of growing into his body. He was kind of a guard, a forward at the at the. Uh, the JV level who kind of had to turn into a center for this Rochester team and yeah. had, you know, I think had several double doubles on the year and, um, you know, was able to see, even put up big numbers against good teams. Yeah. And then Dawson Perkins from Valley just for his shot blocking ability. Uh, not a big time score. He had a few big, few good scoring games. Uh, but again, I love Dawson just for his rebounding and, and shot blocking. Mm hmm. So that's our uh, our team, all first team, second team, and honorable mention for boys basketball. And I, I think if you picked five kids out of that list and, and took them and put them on a the floor, it'd be a really good team. I yeah. mean, there's there's a lot of really good players there, and uh, some will be back, and and some are going to be moving on. But uh, you know, it's going to be exciting to see, you know, as you move on to to the next year, uh, you know, what those what those players can do. Right, right. I'm 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 really you know. Really intrigued about what that Valley team is going to look like coming back next year with Kaiser and Cumberland. Obviously, they'll miss Shepard and Perkins, Braden Shepard and Perkins mm -hmm. are graduating, but with with um, you know Kaiser and Cumberland and, and Riley Shepard coming back, and then they'll have uh, you know some some kids who got some good JV experience mm -hmm. uh, who I think will will help fill out that lineup. But uh, I'm, I'm curious, and and I think Valley had a good middle school program as well. So yeah, and Rochester, I, uh, you know, obviously with only one senior this year. Uh, they're going to have most of their team back, and and you know they they're going to look to uh, be better, obviously than they were this year for sure. Yeah, I think just sp spending some time in the weight room is going to help out as much as on the basketball court. Yeah, and uh, you know they got a you know a couple of nice freshmen like you said in in Ryan Ertz and in Xavier Vance that mm -hmm. got a lot of really good minutes and some good experience and. So bringing them back, right, to go with gonna, hunting, to go with hunting leisure and McLaughlin, it's gonna be a big and then those class. guys, and you know, I mean, Evan Elliott will be missed, but a lot of guys will be coming back. I think you know, Brock Bowers was didn't make our list, but he's a kid who yeah. really came on toward the end of the season. I think his younger brother Drew might play a role in next year's varsity as well. Yeah, and um, you look Bogger, down, Bogger, uh, there's a lot. Yeah, of, their, their C team was really good this year as well. Yeah, C team went 15 and 0. I know Joe McCarter decided to retire from coaching. I, an undefeated season, kind of like Coach K. Yeah, yeah, went out on top. Yeah, went out on top, yeah. I, I think he was doing some stuff with uh, with Ella that uh, was going to conflict as far as the IHSA stuff. Yeah, but I've heard a lot of good things about Rochester's eighth grade class as well. Yeah. There's an, a third Bowers on the way who's an eighth grader this year, so, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, so a lot, uh, lot of good things coming up mm -hmm. uh, for, uh, for all of our teams, I think. Uh, you know, it should be an uh, exciting year next year. And don't I know Casson's graduating a lot of kids. Do not count out the comments. I know they're graduating all five starters, but that JV team was dynamite at twenty and two. Yeah. Uh, remember the names: Talon Zider, Caleb Stinson, uh, Chain Lob, Hunter. Yeah, I mean K Kane Chain Lob, mm -hmm. uh, Pew. I mean this. Do not do not feel sorry for Carl Davis at all. <laughs> yeah. Uh, do not feel sorry for him yet. Watch them next year. They will be. I will be very curious to see where they get put as far as sectionals are concerned, but they will be a competitive ball club at Casta next year. Yeah, and that's, uh, I guess, another thing that we got to think about, too. I, I know the enrollment uh, figures have been released and re-released. Um, you know, so 
we may have some uh, some juggling of uh, teams and what sectionals they're playing in as well. Right. We'll find out on Tuesday, May third, who's in what sectional. I know the IHS the, the IHSA had a minute at a executive committee meeting uh, last Friday, that March twenty fifth, and they basically said we've okay, we're forming the committees now to figure out who goes where. But the enrollment figures are out, and what we think is going to happen is we think Rochester is going to stay in two A. They're going to be right below the line. So it's a nice place to be, mm -hmm. right below the line. I think it would be like the second largest school in 2A for girls and boys basketball. We think Pioneer is going up from 1A to 2A. Mm -hmm. We think North Miami is going up from 1A to 2A. We think Bremen, Fairfield, Rensselaer, and Boone Grove are all going up from 2A to 3A. Mm -hmm. Again, Boone Grove, always tough mm -hmm. in girls and boys basketball. Uh, you know, Fairfield had a great year. I mean, that that will also have a big impact in volleyball. Mm -hmm. Um Right, right, because the Rochester uh, volleyball team generally goes to Bremen for sectional. Right. And girls basketball, Fairfield made it to semi-state this year in girls basketball. Now they may be going up to 3A. That's a strong Bremen program. I mean, Bremen had some great wins this year in girls mm -hmm. basketball. Mm -hmm. uh, and some great wins boys basketball. I mean, beat, beat Argus twice. Um, yeah. And then, of course, that Rensselaer team that came out of nowhere to win that two-way boys basketball sectional, their first sectional title in 17 years. And they they were pretty young, as I recall. As I recall, I know Tate Drone is graduating, but they bring a lot of kids back, mm -hmm. and they might be in 3A. So it's going to be a different kind of outlook. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you've got Westville going down, apparently, from 2A to 1A. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but South Central staying in 2A. So interesting hmm. how how that will line up. It seemed like there, there are not many teams in the South Bend area in 2A, but there are a lot of South Bend teams that are going to have to cram in in 3A. They have to, in fact, it's really going to be more than one sectional. Mm -hmm. So we've kind of a sectional kind of in the South Bend urban area and then maybe one kind of in that slightly rural area, like where do you put like Bremen and Fairfield in comparison to Mishawaka Marion and South Bend St. Joe. Mm -hmm. That'll be interesting how that all shakes down. And, uh, you know, at one point they were talking about possibly adding a uh, big school class. Has that kind of been shelved for now or...? Uh, I think it sounds like it. We haven't heard a lot from it lately, but maybe not necessarily adding a fifth class, but maybe making the fourth class, the 4A class, only really, really big schools. Mm -hmm. So instead of four equally sized classes, mm -hmm. have a 4A class with maybe just 32 schools or maybe just 64 schools, mm -hmm. and then a bigger 3A, a bigger 2A, a bigger 1A. Right. Because the disparity from the smallest 4A school right now to the biggest 4A school is pretty pretty stark. Right. Yeah. Do, I know people are clamoring for separate schools for private classes. That's not going to happen. That, that would not survive. That would, that would bring about lawsuits, and I don't think the IHSA is interested in that. And anyway, they're going to say, hey, Central Noble will be Fort Wayne Blackhawk in the regional. So, mm -hmm. so I do not uh, – people want that, but I be careful what you wish for there. I don't think that's going to – I don't think it's going to happen, and I don't think. And again, not every private school is really great in sports. That's in fact most well, most aren't. And I, I think the success factor has alleviated some of that mm -hmm. stress. You know, the the days where Lafayette Central Catholic was playing Pioneer in the first round of sectional in football. Yeah. You know that a lot of that was from that. Mm -hmm. You know, they were number one, and Pioneer was number two, or vice versa. Um, you know that right. has alleviated a little bit of that. Right there, there's always those kind of individual matchups. I, I get it. North Judson fans were frustrated when, boy, we had a great year. We've got all these guys, and then we run into Fort Wayne Blackhawk in the regional. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? Fort Wayne Blackhawk lost a few hours later. Right, they ran into Central Noble. So yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, now by the way, LCC looks like they'll be moving up from one A to two A to an increased enrollment. Mm -hmm. Their girls and boys basketball teams are both state runners up. Mm -hmm. And so they're moving up. And they're moving up, due yeah. To enrollment size. To, to, in two way due to enrollment, along with Pioneer and North Miami. So that, yeah. So you'll have LCC and Andrean and Fort Wayne Blackhawk all in two way. Yeah. Well, Fort Wayne Blackhawk boys in two way. Mm hmm. And then the Andrean boys kind of had a down year this year, but I imagine they won't be, historically speaking, they've always, they don't stay down for long. Yeah. And their girls' program was fantastic. I mean, their girls' program handed South Central their only loss of the season in the regional. Yeah, Tony yeah. Shub does a we, great job we there. Know, we know, uh, we know, Tony we know that very coach well. a little bit. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Former Culver coach. So the two-way North will be tough. Yeah, next year. Yeah. 
Well, we're looking forward to it. What's that date again? You said May? Tuesday, May 3rd May is when 3rd. we'll find out all the sectional alignments. And, of course, we've got so many other sports besides just the winter sports. Mm-hmm. I am very curious to see what's going to happen football-wise. I think Winnemac's going to go up 2 way. Mm-hmm. I think that's what most people think. So that is going to change a lot because uh, as long as Coach Hendricks is there, Winnemac's going to have a good football team on the field. I know they, I know they graduated a lot of kids, but... Yeah, 22 is a pretty big uh, graduating class. Yeah, that was a huge graduating yeah. class, but... Um, yeah, I mean, that that could be really interesting because, you know, Pioneer in, in 2A, then Winnemac possibly moving up there. And, you know, what, is, what does that do for a, a North Judson? You know, and then you talked about LCC might be up there as well. Mm-hmm. You know, so, you know, yeah. that could be interesting again as well yeah. in 2A. Yeah. So. And we know already how good LaVille is going to be. Right. Yeah, don't forget about them because, uh, you know, what they did last year is just a yeah. start. And I'm very curious to see what the volleyball sectional is going to look like. Are we going to have, I mean, is Pioneer going to be in 2A? And if, are they going to be in that sectional with, right? Are they going to be in the sectional with South Central? I mean, that's a good South Central team. Mm-hmm. Or are they going to be maybe down more in the, uh, with like Lewis Cass and those teams? So it's, again, the volleyball sectional was just so weird. Mm-hmm. I mean, Rochester in a sectional with Westville. Mm-hmm. I mean, that was so and with Bremen and LaVille in there. So I, I'm, I'm curious to see how the, the volleyball section is going to be really interesting and really unique. Yeah, because, uh, you know, as far as uh, classes go, that's one of the only classes that Pioneer still, you know, boys basketball and volleyball, uh, most of them are already playing in 2A. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, softball, girls basketball, football, they're mm-hmm. already playing in 2A due to success. Right. And how, to, how to, the other thing that I've been curious about, too, is, if they're reclassifying, uh, you know, what did they do with the success factor? Because last year was the two-year period. So are they going to reset that based on the last two years? You know, how, right. how are they going to do that? going to affect Pioneer football is kind of what I'm interested in. In boys basketball, it's not going to have any uh, impact at all because I think nobody uh, moved in mm-hmm. over the last two years up or up or down. So, And it, it may be a moot point anyway if Pioneer gets moved up due to enrollment. And if LCC gets moved up, yeah, yeah, so due to enrollment, so. right, right, and it, you know, and it, if it doesn't get moved up due to enrollment, then it's like you know, how are they doing that? Right. And soccer, I'm very curious to see what that boys soccer sectional will look like. Will it be ca- kind of a four team sectional again with Caston, mm-hmm. or will they make it five or six teams? Yeah. But once Argus got bumped up due to success factor, that opened the door for Caston to win a sectional. Uh, will they have the same kind of chance this uh, coming up in the fall of 2022? That uh, success factor period will be impactful for the Argus boys soccer team as yeah. well. You know, how how does that uh, affect them? Right, right. Do they stay up in in two A? Right, because that's just a different world. That oh, they, it's I mean, tremendously different. I mean, can, I mean, to think of you know Argus won all those one A sectionals, were seemingly they didn't have to do anything extraordinary to win those sectionals, mm-hmm. but then you think about two A and they played an extraordinary game against Fort Wayne Canterbury. And lost in a shootout. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, yeah, I'll be very curious to see how the Dragons are affected. You know, the difference, obviously, with soccer only having three classes, I mean, that's relevant to if you were in football, you know, instead of moving up to 2A, they basically they moved up to, to 3A. Mm-hmm. You know, they basically moved up two classes by moving up one class. So that success factor really, uh, you know, is, is a big impact on, on soccer programs. Yeah. So... Yeah, it's going to be interesting, you know, uh, as we get into that. We'll, right. we'll find out more And we think soon. we think Rochester will be one of the smallest schools in 2A, mm-hmm. but it would certainly make a difference if they were if they went back down to 1A. Mm-hmm. I, think the, the, I think the only schools in 2A that were smaller than Rochester were Argus and uh, Providence, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> who were up there because, up there because of, of success factor. Right, yeah. they, weren't, they weren't up there because of size. Yeah. Well, it's going to be interesting. Or, and, or uh, Lutheran, yeah. Yeah. So uh, we'll uh, we'll talk more about that when that uh, information yeah, becomes available. Yeah, yeah, still over a month away, but yeah, yeah. So, so, so this is kind of what we think about. Yeah. So when I get done here, I'm going to go in and uh, upload all those stories uh, into the blog with the uh, the full stories for all the uh, winter sports all RTC teams. So uh, take a look at those, and uh, if you haven't had a chance, I did a little video um, for uh, you know in memory of uh, Dick Belcher. 
Uh, it's on our Facebook page. It's also on RTC4.com and Twitter. So take a look at that. It's uh, got some some really neat footage of uh, you know some old First Federal uh, programs that they did back in the day. So that's uh, that's kind of neat to to look back and get a, a shot of a younger Val T uh, in there in the in the studio and. You know Tom Bear. You know you haven't uh, haven't seen him in a while, and yeah. Baron and those guys that were at uh, WRI at the time as well. So uh, we'll be back next week with uh, we'll talk a lot of spring sports. Right. One last thing: the IHSA announced at their executive committee meeting that the 2024 wrestling state finals will occur were scheduled to occur the same weekend of the NBA All Star Game, which mm-hmm. will be at Gamebridge Fieldhouse. So that's going to be moving. So we'll see what happens there. Might they just move? Might they move it to a different venue, or might they just maybe move the dates? Maybe move the dates around. Maybe move the season up a week. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was a con- conflict with the boys' basketball too, wasn't there? And there's a conflict with boys' basketball. This I, I put out a tweet and it got tweeted. Or it got retweeted by some guy named John Harrell. Huh. And all of a sudden, my tweet went like kind of mini viral. People yeah. were Hinkle Fieldhouse, Assembly Hall, Mackey Arena, yeah, uh, the the Ford Center in Evansville, the Fort Wayne Coliseum, Worthen Arena in Muncie. Yeah. So who know, who knows? But yeah, there are, there are NCAA tournament games that particular weekend in 2024. So they're going to have to do something. They they can't have it the date that they had said. They might have to put. My guess is that the HSA is not going to want to get rid of Gainbridge Fieldhouse as a venue right. unless they absolutely positively had to. My guess is they would just will move it back a week. Yeah. Because isn't that? I think that's what they did. Was it last year they did that, uh, or was it? Two or three years ago, where they they just basically moved the boys' state finals back a week. I think it was in, was it nineteen the year yeah. before the quarantine. Yeah, there was a two there was a two week break between semi state and state, and I think that's kind of yeah. I think yeah, that I that would that. be yeah. that would be a possibility. Yeah, I, I don't think the IHSA wants to leave Gamebridge Fieldhouse unless they absolutely had to. I, I I can't see that happening. I know people love to speculate about Hinkle or Assembly Hall, or but again. Uh, or some people even suggested the Purcell Center in South Bend, but I, I just don't see. Again, co- these college venues have been reluctant. I th- there might even be a rule that doesn't allow you to do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, we can hold a high school game in a college venue in a college arena. I remember they tried that Rod- back when Jim Metcalf was the coach. Rochester was going to play somebody at. They're going to play Lewis Cass at Hinkle, or um, Hinkle Fieldhouse, and that wasn't. They they didn't allow that to happen. So. Again, I it's gonna. I, I still think it's gonna be Gambridge Fieldhouse. Yeah, I mean it's so centrally located you, and yeah. beautiful facility, and you know there's a lot of facilities around the state, but you know you want to have that central location if you can. Yeah, if you moved it back a week, it wouldn't upset the apple cart too much. I mean, right. it would, there are eight teams that play in the state finals. Well, and and I don't think anybody would probably uh, get too upset if you just moved everything back a week. Yeah, I mean. If, you know, I, I didn't like that when they did that with the extra week between the semi-state and the state. Mm-hmm. You know, if they could maybe bunch the start of the state tournament. It might have been last year because wasn't there a bunch of weather issues and we're like, well, why don't they just move the start of the tournament back because they've got an extra week in there. Yeah. So yeah. we'll see how that goes. Uh, should be interesting to see, right. uh, you know, how they get those things scheduled out. And, uh, right. and we're talking two years down the road, but it's amazing how people, how just that conversation just draws... It's just a magnet for conversation. People want to Hinkle, Farmers Coliseum, mm-hmm. Worthen Arena. You know, it's interesting how people want to. Of course, you know screen. they used to do it Hinkle. You yeah, know, years and years ago. So yeah. you know, it's you can't get a much better venue, and and it is centrally located. Mm-hmm. So, well, we'll be back next week. We'll talk some uh, some spring sports with you here on Talking Sports with Val. Um, yep. Weather permitting, we'll have a, a game under our belt as far as broadcasting goes. We'll be down at Caston uh, on Thursday for uh, some baseball. Mm-hmm. It should be, uh, you know, we're, we're looking forward to it. I haven't done a cast and baseball game yet. Um, it should be a really good team. Obviously, we talked about Joey Spin uh, on the basketball mm-hmm. floor. He's uh, as good or better on the uh, diamond. He was the RTC Baseball Player of the Year last spring, and with him and Cade Zider, they had two veteran senior pitchers. Yeah. And they're very solid in the middle infield. And, we, yeah, well, I mean, Coach Smollenkoff, he always puts a quality product out on the field. And, uh, you know, after the way we woke up this morning to the snow, hopefully we'll have a little bit more of a, a spring type of day coming yeah. up. Yeah, yeah. Supposed to warm up a little bit. So, all right, that's going to do it for us here today. Take a look at the blog at rtc4.com. You can check a, click on the Valti Sports blog right there and 
we'll have these stories up here uh, shortly for you, and uh, we'll see you next week. Yeah.